here. I'm Ian Gardner and, and welcome. Uh, we haven't done a virtual event like this for a little while. Um, this is the first of our um, mini series that we're doing on team building and talent. Uh, and so you've got an, a, a fantastic panel that we're going to um, uh, be hearing from. Uh, I'm a co-founder at Innovation Bay. We've been doing it along with uh, Faden for almost 20 years now. Uh, I'm also a VC. I'm an investment partner with uh, Gilex Ventures. Uh, also joining us is most of the rest of the Innovation Bay team. We're almost 10 people now. Uh, we've, you know, COVID's not been necessarily great for, for many of us, but uh, we've had some uh, some um, tailwinds uh, with us. So it's been fantastic to, to see the response to the initiatives we've done. Uh, but thanks to everyone uh, on the team uh, and for you all joining. Like, we are all about trying to connect the startup community across Australia and make it better. Um, before we get started, uh, let me just acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country uh, throughout Australia, because uh, we are broadcasting everywhere, uh, and their connections to the land, sea and community. And look, we do pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and we definitely extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So welcome along if you're joining. Uh, if you don't know about Innovation Bay, and if this is the first time uh, you've come along, then welcome. Uh, but we are a leading community for the startup ecosystem across Australia and uh, New Zealand, doing it since 2003. Uh, and yeah, we love creating connections between founders, leaders and investors. Uh, we are on Hopin. Uh, it's a little bit different to, to Zoom. Uh, there's some fantastic uh, networking capability that we'll, we'll touch on at the end. Uh, so it's a little bit like an experience, a physical event. You can kind of choose where to go. Uh, this is the main stage. Uh, you're going to be joined by our speakers in a second. Uh, as soon as the event is finished, which will probably be about 10 to 1, uh, we're going to open up some networking uh, and you can, you know, join either room or some, uh, you know, join the speakers in a room or do some one-to-one -one networking, which is actually a lot of fun and, and really valuable. So let's, uh, if you can hang around afterwards, it's, uh, it'll be fantastic. Uh, we uh, are bringing this event to you uh, with our Series A and Beyond membership tier. So like Innovation Bay has rolled out some membership tiers. Uh, it's called Summit. Uh, we've got 40 members in there. Basically, if your business is worth 20 million bucks or more, uh, is kind of the, the criteria to get in. Uh, all three of our speakers today are members of Summit, uh, and we have some fantastic founders in there. Uh, we've had a lot of them in the podcast and quite a few on, on these shows. So really looking forward to, to hearing from them. Uh, that's our sort of uh, headline partner. But we also have some national partners that we really want to say thank you to because we could not do Innovation Bay without them. So AWS, IAG, Farmark Ventures, KPMG's High Growth Ventures and Macquarie Bank. Uh, we could not do this without them. And we really, really appreciate their support for us and the whole ecosystem. Um, this, as I said before, is part one of the mini series. Uh, it's all around team building and talent. Uh, look, the last few months, every time we talk to a founder, we just hear that hiring and, uh, and, and scaling, but specifically around hiring, is a huge challenge. Uh, challenge. Uh, how do you build a, build a culture? How do you make it inclusive? Uh, how do you just do it? Um, so when you're attracting the right people and retaining the good ones, building high performing teams, that's what this three part series is about. So we're going to hear from summit founders, some operational experts, some investors in the last one, uh, and they're going to share their experiences of how to scale a company and build the right team and culture. Um, this, as we said, is part one, um, the front line of scaling. Uh, as I say, we have three members of Summit who are going to be sharing their experiences of hiring and scaling. I think all three of them have been hiring unbelievably uh, quickly over the last few years. So uh, we have the, the Brains Trust here. Um, they're going to discuss the growth that they've seen and how they've thought about the scaling process. You know, when what lessons have you learned? When did you hire a, uh, a recruiter? Uh, what impact has, has this had in the organization and how are you thinking about the future growth? Um, I'm going to stop sharing. A uh, quick reminder to everyone that there is a Q&A function that we're going to be uh, going with. So definitely want to get some interactivity going. So please do ask some questions in the way and uh, I'll jump back in uh, after about half an hour of uh, uh, the, the, the chat between them uh, and I'll facilitate some questions. So uh, quick intro to, to the panel. Uh, Emma Weston uh, is the co-founder and CEO of AgriDigital. 
Uh, she's a fabulous woman. I've known her for a long time now. Multi-awarded platform, AgriDigital is leading the way in digitizing, connecting, and securing global agricultural supply chains uh, from farmer to consumer. So we'll hear more about that from Emma. Um, Sibi is the founder and CTO of Baraha, uh, which is a rapidly growing startup. Uh, it's got revolutionary LIDAR for self-driving vehicles, which uh, hopefully we'll hear all about. But uh, yeah, deep tech, uh, fantastic business and delighted that Sibi is joining us. Uh, and James Ferguson. So James, actually, has just been in the podcast. So if you if you want to get a deep dive with James, uh, James is the CEO of Immutable. Uh, Mutable's first scaling solution for NFTs. Now, if it said NFT probably a year ago, no one would have known what the hell I was talking about, but now we do, which is awesome. Uh, NFTs, they don't compromise security or decentralizing of the world's uh, leading public blockchain, which is what uh, uh, he's built this on. So again, I think we might hear a bit more about that from, from James. Uh, Emma, uh, I'm gonna hand to you and jump off the stage and yeah, have a great chat. Awesome, thanks Ian. Um, hey, Zibi. Hey, James. Hi, Emma. Hello. Hello. Great to have you both. Okay, so we have started a little late, so we're going to talk twice as fast so that we can um, cover all the material. Now we'll see how we go. But um, firstly, can we just give a little bit more context to who you are, um, companies, stage of growth, and I guess your take on today's topic around uh, team building and talent, but kind of 20 words or less, because we've got heaps that we're going to try and cover. Maybe we'll start off with you, Sibi. Sure. Uh, thanks. I'm Sibi. I'm the CTO of Baraha. Uh, we have started the company to bring to market a revolutionary LIDAR for autonomous vehicles. We say it's the laser eyes for driverless cars. Uh, we're about 150 people today. We raised the Series B earlier this year, and we have uh, completed a partnership with a major tier one automotive supplier called Vianeer to deliver our technology into passenger vehicles. Awesome, James. Fantastic. Uh, I'm James Ferguson. I'm the CEO of Immutable. Uh, our goal is if anyone has children or likes video games themselves and have kids who spend way too much time and money playing video games, uh, our goal is to stop that being a waste of time. In fact, we want to completely switch it so that uh, playing video games and interacting in these digital worlds is one of the most meaningful things that people can do financially. We want there to be no separation between the same level of way that people would trade shares to how they're gonna trade their Fortnite skins and earn their Fortnite skins and essentially try and make digital worlds real with these property rights inside them. We have scaled to 105 people full-time. Uh, we'll probably get double again over the next year, roughly. Uh, and this is the company's about three and a half years old. So it's been a uh, reasonably wild ride. Uh, and the, we've definitely learned a lot of things around scaling along the journey. Awesome. And I'm Emma Weston and I'm the CEO and co-founder at AgriDigital. And we're digitizing the grain supply chain from farmer through to consumer and quite a bit smaller than, um, than where you guys are at. So I really feel like I'm almost in a masterclass today with the two of you. Um, so I'm like one of the luckiest founders alive. We're doing a series A. So all of this is um, in front of us at the moment. Um, Sibi, let's kick off. Um, when I think about talent and team building, you know, we think about attracting talent, we think about retaining, we think about building and sustaining high performance. Is this the way to think about the topic today and how much time as CTO and as a founder do you spend on those activities? Yeah, this is part of the, the key insight into hiring, I think, is, you know, when you come from an engineering background, when you work at a big company, hiring happens through, you know, like an HR function or something, it's dissociated from you being an engineer. Um, what I learned as being a founder is you have to think about this differently. What you need are the best people to make your startup successful. And the way you get the best people is you have to sell. Hiring is primarily a sales function. And as founders, we all understand we have to sell to customers, but I think so many of us would rather push the idea of hiring um, out of our minds. Uh, but look in the early stages of the startup, I mean, you know, you just spend 50% of your time hiring. Today I spend, I don't know, it's probably 20, 30% of my time in hiring and hiring type activities. It is a lot of people management, interaction, making networks, making connections. It's critical. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge amount of effort um, and time when you think about what you're building. Um, but we're not just building product, are we? We are building teams, right? That, that's part of what we're doing. Does that sort of ring true for you, James? Is, is that your experience as well with the wild ride that you and Immutable have been on over the past, like, 18 months in particular? Completely. I think that there is no, no more important thing that a founder can do than focus on hiring and making sure that you get the right people and the right culture. And getting like getting the wrong person is disastrous, but even getting a suboptimal person means that that seat is now filled. And whether it, they're suboptimal because of their expertise, their level of ownership, or just the way in which they, like they're not a cultural ad or a cultural fit, uh, then every single person that you add onto the company is either trending the company towards success or trending it towards failure. And I think, a lot of people who want to start early stage companies start with the idea that they can do everything themselves and they can solve all problems. But ultimately, the only level of scale that comes through is by bringing more people in. And James, before, like we, we've had the benefit, all three of us, of catching up um, and doing a little bit of planning to hopefully make this super interesting for everyone who's, you know, dialing in today and also watching this afterwards. But, you know, as part of that prep, we spoke about some of those inflection points um, that businesses go through from startup to scale up, you know, through to more mature. Um, and probably none of us are in that more mature phase, right, where we're, we're still in startup to scale up phase. But there's something that you also said that stuck with me, and I've actually even mentioned it a couple of times already just in the last 48 hours to get some responses from people. And that was around the impact of COVID and remote working for now, at least, on those inflection points and perhaps that they're changing so that, um, you know, you mentioned something around that the, the complexity is doubling at half the number of people. And I took that to mean that kind of, you know, 25 or 30 is, you know, the new 50 in terms of people and team building and talent acquisition. Is that what you meant? And can you kind of dig into that a bit deeper? Awesome. So I think that, uh, like, I've read a couple of things which say that there are a couple of traditional inflection points, right? The first is from one person to about seven to 10 people, everyone knows what everyone else is doing more or less. Everyone can be in the same room. Everyone can work on the same stuff together. So the level of communication and organizational complexity is pretty low. Then suddenly you move into separate teams, right? Maybe you have uh, seven people managing seven people or seven teams to seven people. And you get to about the 49, 50 mark. Maybe some of those teams can stretch a little and you get a little past there. But at that stage, you have completely separate teams. So not only is it just more than one team, but you have multiple teams who will need to start coordinating with each other and work out how you work together. And it's another beast entirely. And then you go beyond that, right? And there's a, meant to be another natural in, inflection point at around that 250 to 300 person point, again, where suddenly you have seven leaders with seven managers with seven teams. Uh, what is really interesting though, is we can just have a look at it, it, each one of them, which is, can you on the one to 10 be in the same room with everyone so that everyone picks up everything that everyone is doing by osmosis? That is gone. Uh, maybe you can have like a couple of Slack channels, which people are all in, but the complexity starts getting a lot more complex earlier. And companies and teams need to build in that infrastructure to start handling that complexity way earlier. This is a, I think both a blessing and a curse, right? Which is uh, you can bring in this infrastructure to solve it when there's fewer people involved, but at the same time, you now need to bring in much more mature ways of communicating and essentially sort the crap out about how you want to communicate with each other as a team earlier on in the journey. And I think it is probably at about the the double the level of complexity. So this, yeah, this could be a good thing, right? But for a lot of us who are early stage founders, um, you know, we're still maturing ourselves as managers of businesses. Um, you know, perhaps we don't have access to the capital that might have, we thought, might have been that inflection point at 50 where you could 
you know, bring in some of the processes and people around you that could help deal with that complexity. I'm kind of interested in exploring this and we can just have this as a discussion between the three of us, of course. Um, we don't have to kind of single off on Q&A, but what's the role and do you guys have an internal recruiter? When did that person come in? You know, how did you use them? If so, do you have a blend of internal, external outreach? Just let's kind of focus in on on that for a moment. That's right. I can, I can talk about so when we reached about 50 people, I think that's when we had um, brought in a head of talent. And as I mentioned, the key learning there is that your people team and your talent team are different. They're different types of people that do those roles. Mm -hmm. Hiring a talent person is really important because um, previous to that, we were just doing things. I mean, we were you know pushing out job ads into like Seek and just like casting them into the wind. And when you do that, I mean, yeah, you might get some good people. But what you're doing is you're leaving it up to fate. There's no process. There's no method for trying to get the best talent in. So we brought in a head of talent. And right away, what they do is a good one is going to start building. Hey, this is what the framework for hiring is going to be. They set in, this is the process we're going to use for hiring, for interviewing, for selecting candidates, uh, and for candidate experience. And all these are really important. So when a candidate comes to the company to have an interview, I mean, they just need to feel like you have your stuff together. And if they see a really sloppy hiring process, they're going to take away that that's what the company is run like. And, you know, we're startups, so, you know, maybe it's true, but that's their first look and that's your chance to really first sell them. They should feel like you have your, your, everything under control. They get to meet the founders. They get to meet the hiring team um, and everything works really well. Do you have that kind of process, James? I mean, do you have an internal recruiter or a head of talent who's helping you at this stage? So we have currently four internal recruiters and two RPOs as well who are starting. So our talent team is scaled up quite a bit. Um, I wish we had pulled on a permanent uh, head of talent or talent acquisition person earlier on in the journey. Okay, uh, lesson, we, right? there's a lesson in that. Yes, definitely. So we pulled on someone and this person was very talented, but we pulled on someone who was uh, essentially a contractor who would embed in your team and you would they would still get a commission when you hired someone. And I think that the interesting lesson for us was that incentives were a little bit wrong where this person wanted to get the volume of hiring. Mm -hmm. And we as a company and any early stage company needs to maximize for quality of hire rather than just uh, quantity. So if I were to do it again, I would get someone who is purely on uh, like a fixed salary who you know is great and culturally aligned and then solve for any eventual incentive later when the company's processes are a little more sophisticated. We weren't able to handle the incentives of someone, you know, making 7% or whatever. I can't remember what the specific number was. Every single time they made a hire, we weren't, didn't have our good enough process yet. I think going down the city route and going and grabbing a head of talent first and setting up a great process uh, is probably a more optimal way of doing it. And um, there's so much we want to get to, and we were a little late kicking off, and I know we've got Q&A and networking afterwards, and, you know, one of the things we've spoken about is how talent begets talent or, you know, talent brings on talent. Maybe that's something we can explore later. But if we move to thinking about retention um, for the moment, um, my mind jumps to ESOPs. Is, is that right? Is that what I should be thinking about? And, you know, does that have the same impact whether we're talking about a team in Australia versus a team in the US or Japan or you know wherever it may be how are you guys thinking about retention I'd love for it to be one consistent message but the reality is and I think we're learning this now is um, it's very different in Australia and, and the US so we have a, an R&D team in California and without fail every one of those employees what they care about most is the option package the what is the equity in the company they have because that's what they understand is wealth creation like having a part ownership in a company and having that company grow that's what's exciting and in the bay area i mean that's just happening everywhere so that's what is normal there uh, conversely here in australia i think you know we've been always very generous with esop but i find that it seems to have a very low impact on retention that um for in general Australians don't value equity. They think of it as a nice to have, but if you give an option of like um, much more equity or a little more cash, they will take, it seems like they'll take the cash every time. So, I mean, I think we're still trying to figure out what is the right balance um, for ESOP in Australia. And, that, and this is continually a work in progress for us. Yeah. 
I, we've kind of found the same thing. I don't know if that's you, James, where um, ESOP has sometimes been incredibly motivating for certain individuals, particularly those with real growth mindsets and perhaps who have had some background in the Valley or, you know, in similar, um, you know, crucible type startup environments. Um, but then we've also found, you know, ESOP almost seemed incidental um, to, to certain um you know, employees, has, has that been your experience and have you got kind of other retention tools that are in place or strategies? Yeah, I, I think I've experienced a lot of the same things that you guys have. Uh, people who are senior and people who are overseas care about the ESOP so much. And we at Immutable, every single full-time employee has part of the ESOP. And I actually think especially early on, this is something that we've improved at, but especially early on, we weren't communicating the value well enough. Mm -hmm. It's not like over in San Francisco where next door there's another billion dollar company where, you know, the first 100 people all made a million bucks or whatever it is. Everyone understands that. But if we don't do a good enough job, essentially marketing it internally, this is what it means. Here's the education piece. Here's what it could look like if we hit these goals. Here's what we've been tracking along in the past. Then... I think just because we as founders care about this a lot, and obviously the reason we've made one of the main drivers is that we want to own part of this company that we built. Yeah. People don't have that education piece, but when we started talking about it regularly on about a two month to quarterly basis, which is here's your ESOP, here's why it's valuable, here's why people in the US care about it. People in Australia don't really understand it, but every single person has it. And I think it's important as well to say, if you can, Every person has it so that you can get up and say, hey, we are all owners here. We all want what's best and we will win together um, without having any lack of integrity uh, that goes on as well. But there's a lot of work that's needed to make it work. The ESOP by itself without the communication piece is not, uh, it's not sufficient. Yeah, so it's kind of a, a little bit of an extension of what you were saying earlier, Sibi, about, you know, um, HR and, you know, talent and team building, you know, being a sales activity, you know, in some ways. Um, and also, I guess, the lack of experience in Australia in particular has made ESOP reality a challenge, right? Because we just ne haven't necessarily had that kind of big unicorns and others. I mean, we're just starting to, to go into that phase. Um, if we kind of switch gears and, you know, we think about... Uh, the fact we're all on the lookout for some talent. We always hear about war on talent and we can probably debate about whether or not it's true, but what about when that awesome talent leaves? Um, you know, how do we manage that as a founder? How do we communicate that to the team? Um, you know, have you guys got any war stories or suggestions um, for me and for others in that space? Sure. I mean, I think it's pretty common that as you grow as a company, you'll get um, some employees that are really key at the beginning, then maybe just decide that either, I mean, sometimes they burn out, sometimes they just realize they would much prefer to be at another smaller early stage startup. We've had lots of that happen where people just say, well, now the company's at a size where it's less fun, so they want to go back and, and do something early stage. Um, and that actually has a huge negative impact on the team because, um, you know, if you've got a good culture, everyone's interconnected and everyone wants to work together when they see that as a sign oh that's a signal that something's not right here maybe they start to get cold feet uh so i think it's important that you know you, know, you should always be hiring so when people like this leave you actually at least have you know you kind of have already started this um this preparation so you're able to bring on more talent and and i think that's the best way to solve that someone really great leaves but you keep bringing on incredible people and people that the team sees, oh well, now this is a level up in what we can we can do. Um, and we brought some some people on in the company, which I would say, as someone with a background in in optics and photonics, I think we have hired some of the top talent in the world in some of these skills. Uh, and so the rest of the Baraha team gets the chance, the opportunity to work with people like that that are the best at what they do. Awesome. Um, I yeah, I, go ahead, entirely. I would just add one thing to it, which is, I think even if someone tells you that they're going to move on and it's, you know, a punch in the gut uh, because you haven't prepped the ready for, you know, a replacement or there's a low bus factor, I think it's really important to set the right standard and celebrate what they've done and throw a party 
at the end of the day. Um, uh, I can remember it would have been end of last year, December last year, we had one of our really, really talented engineers uh, who they ended up getting an offer to go from a senior engineer with us to go like lead Google Creative Lab or something with a you know price <laughs> rise that you can't even comprehend when you're looking at it. And in that case, there's just not a lot you can do if someone's offered their dream job over at Google and they've already done the startup thing for a little bit. And even if we could have been like, oh, come on, we'll try and get something. At the end of the day, the best thing is like throw a party, tell them how proud you are of what they've accomplished and tell that to the whole team. And then they get to go out and spread the culture which you've developed internally, externally, and they'll constantly like look back fondly on the time that you guys have together. Plus also refer new candidates, right? Uh, when someone is interested about leaving Google or one of their other friends wants to go find another job uh, at another startup, they'll always remember uh, like disproportionately well the ending of their experience. And a lot of people, I think, take it personally uh, when there's no real reason. Everyone's on the, the earth trying to do the best they can and the, our paths will cross with everyone for a while, but ultimately everyone will, I, will eventually leave the company. Uh, like it's not, it's not, grasping for permanency is an illusion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I know that we've, we want to have some time for questions and I'm sure, you know, there's plenty of people on this call as I see the numbers here. So I'm sure there's going to be heaps of questions coming through. So we might sort of bring it to a wrap. But before we do, the reality is that a lot of what we've discussed today um, you know, is probably not completely new to founders. They're, they're, they're you know, and to other senior um, team members who are on the call today. But somehow, hopefully, we've normalised some of this um, for everyone so that we don't all feel so alone. But sometimes we still, as founders um, and as senior team members, have trouble learning from, you know, the mistakes, the, you know, successes, et cetera, of others. Um, you know, Sibby, James, just to wrap up, have you guys got a couple of tips or things that you have used as founders, um, you know, whether they're books, podcasts, you know, whatever it may be, that you kind of throw out there as recommendations for the crowd that are just some shortcut ways to get on top of team and talent building? For me, I mean, we always recommend The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. I mean, I read that when we started the company and I feel like I read that I don't know, maybe once a year or something. It's just a great read. Lots of great directive advice on what you should do. And especially in those early stages, you know about some things that are like hard conversations about, you know, bringing on executives or removing executives. It gives, just gives you the recipe. This is what you should do. And that then solves the the anguish of about um, what's the best path forward. You just let's do what Ben Horowitz did. <laughs> do what Ben did. James, what about you? I like that. Um, yeah, look, I love the book, Hard Thing About Hard Things. I think one of the things that is best about it is it sort of normalizes that scaling and growing a company is a bit of a shit show and that's okay. And there's no, at the same time, there's nothing new under the sun. All the stuff around your first person leaving or trying to find executive talent, it's all been done before. Even if the industries which we're in are new, the processes around company building and the emotions that come through, they've been felt before and they'll be felt again, ultimately. Uh, I really like the book Scaling Up in terms of just recipes to follow. Uh, I found it very useful in breaking it down into the different areas and then trying to work out uh, exactly where a problem can be categorized to and then hand it off. Uh, also, I really recommend getting an executive coach, uh, something that I've done that has really pushed me. And, you know, it's just someone, it's one thing to have a book that tells you, hey, this has all happened before and you're not experiencing anything new. And it's another to have a live person who's been through it multiple times often and say, of course, like this is something like, I haven't seen this in the exact blockchain industry or LIDAR industry, but traditionally this turns into this and it's a very normal problem. Yeah, awesome. Well, we might hand back to you, Ian, because there's probably heaps of well, questions should... coming through and you're gonna help moderate those so um, sure but <laughs> emma you didn't answer your own question it's the tough job with the moderator like what are your resources that you would well recommend? you know actually i'm reading trillion dollar coach at the moment um which i am loving and i'm going to go old school and you know post it on to a team member and tell them to pass it on to someone else they think they can use that who could use it in the team because i am just it, it, it sort of doesn't matter whether you Google or you're agri-digital, right? You know, to your point, James, a lot of these problems, you know, 
they've been sold for before. It's just a, it's just a question of the scale at which they're being sold at. Um, yeah. So I'm finding this a really good read for anyone who's interested. All right, no, that's uh, that's a good one. I've actually got it in my. Uh, I've got about five audio books that are queued up, and that is one of them. So I'm looking forward to that one. Um, all right, well, let's jump to some questions. Like uh, the great thing about this Q and A is that you can vote them up. Uh, so if you click in the Q and A tab and see a question that you like, so I'll maybe just uh, be lazy and lean in the ones that got the most votes. Uh, so the first one's in from Erica, um, and she says, "What are your thoughts or plans on remote versus in office post COVID?" And uh, there's a second part to that question. What are your views on hiring uh, remotely? And I guess that's, you know, uh, hiring people that you've never met actually face to face. So uh, who wants to answer that? Why don't we go with uh, Sebi first and then James and then Emma? Yeah, so we're in a bit of a different space because we have a, a hardware product and we actually manufacture that in Sydney. So we have a manufacturing line and even with restrictions and we need people to be at the office to be doing that essential work. And we just have everybody else. So most of the engineering staff and all the um, general staff are working remote. <clears throat> Post COVID, I mean, uh, you know, I can see that we're a lot more flexible because I used to, I mean, I really love seeing everybody in the office together. I think we'll be a lot more flexible, but I don't think we'll ever be 100% remote or have roles that are 100% remote. Um, yeah. On the second question, I mean, we haven't been able to fly to the US and I've hired a team that's very specialized R&D people in California, all remote. Uh, additionally, we brought on some people in Detroit and now we've hired an executive in Europe. This all apparently can happen remotely. We used to be needed to shake a hand, but that's amazing how that changed. Yeah. J James, same question with you. Yeah, look, I think, so we're in a great situation where we've just signed a very expensive lease here in the city for everyone to come into right as we hit uh, lot. I think that ultimately there's the opportunity of COVID and remote hiring and then also the threat, right? Which is the opportunity is that suddenly the global talent pool opens up properly and you can start crossing that bridge earlier than companies might have been ready to do it. Uh, and then the threat is how do you keep culture? How do you keep these bonds really strong when it's often just done virtually? And it's something that needs work on it uh, it's a real thing that eventually at a certain scale, you need to hand to someone who's really competent to work it out, I mean, if, to keep on echoing it through the team. But uh, it's almost like it is the reality of the world now. And it's not going back in the bottle. Uh, and so it's time for us to adapt to the new thing, which is that everyone in the office all the time, that way of working is done, uh, especially for tech companies, unless there's a particular reason that you need to be there and just embrace it uh, and see what that does on the talent level. Yeah. Uh, Emma? So just quickly, we're trying to really focus in on um, what is working really well remotely and what isn't working so well and being really clear about what the purpose of a office is for. Um, and uh, we're in the position where we'll be able to sign on to a new lease um, once things open up a little bit. So yeah, commiserations, James, but I'm sure it'll be awesome when you get there. Um, and therefore, thinking about office design in a new way um, is, is something that's kind of challenging us at the moment. Uh, we also have hired um, a small but growing team in the US during the past uh, six months and haven't met any, I haven't met any of them face to face. Um, we used one of our investors in the US to do the first couple of hires. So they were kind of the face to face, you know, in person, closer contact. Um, and then we went for a very senior person first because we knew we would have to build out the team. And so we didn't want to go kind of junior and build up. We wanted to go senior and get that person to team build. So that's just how it's working for us at the moment. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, look, we might lump some of these together. There's there's a few questions around uh, uh, at the point of which you should hire your head of talent. So Fiona McLeod, uh, Mark Donkins. Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah, look, James, like you were referenced in this, so maybe we'll start with you. So, and I'll just read it out. So, uh, James, you mentioned wishing that you'd brought on your head of talent earlier. Uh, what are the early indicators uh, of an opportunity cost of not having that person on board? So, I guess you know, just maybe unpack, you know, at what point you should bring that person on board, and that's kind of what Fiona asked as well. I think as soon as you know that you need to go hire five people or more, I would go get a head of talent because it's probably going to continue accelerating in the in the good case scenario. Um, so I would do it pr pretty early. Like this could be, 
after you've done your first round of funding or your, or second, your second round, round of, funding, of funding and making sure that you uh, have that as a very early first hire because these people will be better at, like, if you go hire the best head of talent and they're really good at hiring, that multiplies across every single person that you then want to hire. Yeah. Uh, Sibby, do you want to touch on that as well? Because you hired pretty early there, didn't you? Yeah, look, I, I maybe I would disagree with James. I don't know. Um, so we hired one around 50 people. And I would imagine we could have done it earlier because it started, our process was really breaking apart. The thing that I always thought was important is, like, first, as founders, you need to learn to hire. And that's a lot of breaking eggs and making mistakes. So in the early days, I mean, like me and my co-founder, we did the hiring. And I think that's important because you want to, like, one of the questions here is about culture. It's really important, I think, that you learn, like, what that means to hire for people you think fit in the culture. And then you get ahead of talent and you can hopefully pass this on. However, I would change maybe what I'm thinking now. Like, you know, James is saying, like, get one early. You know, when we started, I don't think we had such a competitive environment in Australia. Uh, right now, the competition for talent is so fierce that maybe for early stage startups, it is worthwhile to start really early with someone in the talent space. Yeah. I might yeah. double down just city on one of the things you said, which is learning to hire. I think that's crucial. And even if I wouldn't outsource hiring entirely, I would interview uh, yeah. every single person, probably up until 100 people or whatever, it's finally no longer feasible to do so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Luke, just to try and get through some more questions, Emma, I might ask you a different question. <clears throat> uh, this was in from Leopold Lucas. Uh, we often talk about culture when we're hiring. Uh, what does that mean to you? Uh, and do you think these are universal traits or things really specific to your company? Yeah, interesting one. I mean, I think we're really what what motivates us from a hiring perspective and actually you know we're learning this so we're probably still on that learning to hire journey um you know is a, an understanding and a commitment to our vision first and foremost and then trying to understand like what is the culture of the person who's coming in and you know is that akin you know to, to the rest of the team um we just find that kind of the commitment to the vision can get over some cultural fit issues potentially um well, that's what we've found in the past but um i think that you know for us we also have found that we need with, with it's not about hiring for functional skills as much as it is about hiring for the growth mindset and the appetite for scaling um, at the moment for us so it's really understanding someone coming in and understanding the stage that we're at and having an appetite to go to the next stage. And, you know, me as a founder being able to be really clear about what that means. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, Leopold, but maybe Sibby or James want to jump in. I don't know. Yeah. And any, uh, any comments on culture? I know you've both, um, I mean, look, it's for, for any great founder that's, that's sort of top of mind. So uh, when it comes to hiring, Sibby. Yeah, I think it's different for every company. You have to be really clear about what you mean. So, you know, there's that book, which is like the no assholes rule. So that works for a lot of people not to hire assholes. I myself, I don't have a problem with assholes. I mean, I'm a bit of an asshole myself. Uh, where I <laughs> living in Canada, I think there's just a culture of assholeness. -ish. Um, and when I hire people from there, I mean, I find it gets on. I like how people are direct and willing to state their minds and, and open about what they agree with and what they disagree with. Um, so I think it's just incredibly personal what that means to have culture. Yeah. It's also incredibly personal what it means to be an asshole, I suppose. Exactly. And maybe maybe yeah. that's what I mean, Sibi, about like, you can have people who come at a vision in different ways, right? But if we all kind of want the same thing, that becomes like the unifying factor. That doesn't mean we all have to not be assholes or we all have to be assholes, you know, right? Like, Yeah, there's uh, a case for diversity as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, might right, go down the, I might take the controversial approach and go with the disagreeing one. Um, Great. I think it's really important for an early team to define who they are and also who they want to be aspirationally. And that doesn't mean like diversity should be part of it, but choosing those core values, I think is crucial. Uh, so the values that we ended up with was ownership, uh, growth mindset, uh, radical candor, and quickly testing and iterating. And while we still look for people who are mission aligned, there's a great phrase that we throw about, which is, uh, you know, if they're enthusiastic for the mission or enthusiastic about the role, that adds 25 IQ points. Uh, 
I th- for us, it's a you have to have at least like a th- strong thumbs up on th- each on three of those values, and you can't have a thumbs down on any of them. Uh, for us, the like, and we want that to continue as we grow. Uh, and so the like asshole versus no asshole thing. There's definitely like ways that w- we paint out. What does it mean to give? Be radically candid. For some people, it's probably a little bit direct for people compared to what they're used to, but it, that's the education piece. And as we scale, we want to make sure that we get it right at first and then allow that to compound uh, later on when it's almost impossible to change. Yeah. Uh, all right, look, we've got time for probably one more. Uh, and, and James, this is directed at you, but I'm going to pivot it into a question that's kind of directed to everyone. So let me read it out. It's anonymous, so I don't know who asked it. Uh, James, as a relatively young founder, did you find age creating any obstacles or stigma when hiring? Uh, soon to graduate myself, but cautious how that might interplay with hiring experienced individuals. And then the, uh, actually, I'll, I'll let you answer that and I'll answer, uh, ask a similar but different question to the other two. So, James. Awesome question. Um, it's probably rougher for my co-founder and brother, Robbie, than it is for me, who's uh, five years younger. So he's still 24. Uh I would say no, though, like at the end of the day, people are looking for companies and uh, people to join who have an exciting mission. And in some ways, while there are like real disadvantages of being young, mostly that we don't know that much stuff yet. We're going to know much more stuff in 10, 20, 30 years time as we've sold some of this stuff before. There are our, our advantages as well, right? Which is that in terms of uh, emerging tech, which often starts trending with younger demographics as well, that we can have real insights there. I think it's important. You don't need to be the perfect has done it before person. You just need to know a change in the world that is coming and a good luck that is going to help people based on that and have the level of credibility and expertise in that and be willing to grow and solve all the rest of it as you go on that journey. Uh, and I think that knowing enough about the problem space and uh, is a way that you can get around the fact that uh, being relatively young, we don't have that much experience yet. Yeah. Now, and Sibi and Emma are only slightly older than you, so I won't use the, <laughs> the age question with them. But, you know, there's a question around uh, the, the talent. You know, when I was there, when I was a founder, I suppose still, still am. I mean, the reality is, as founders, you should be hiring people that are way better than you and sort of terrify you with their skill. And, you know, you're often thinking, why would this person come and work for me? So any advice in that? Uh, Emma, I'll start, start with you on that one. Well, look, I find it easy to find people who are way better than me um, at so many things, to be honest. Um, no, but every, every good founder says that. Yeah. But one of the things that I guess I'm clear that I bring um, and that I don't have to necessarily hire for and same for my co-founders is really deep domain expertise in the grain supply chain in our case, right? And the way that technology is applied to the grain supply chain. So we don't have to go and look for people necessarily that have that direct expertise. Um, therefore, I try to, yeah, I try to ask as many questions of current team and also future hires about like where they're gonna plug the gaps um, and accelerate the pace and raise the bar. Um, and I'd say our last few hires have definitely you know, in particular, have done that. We've just really been able to um, outsize ourselves as a company and ourselves as a founder group, which has been awesome. Yeah. And, and Sibi, have you had this problem before? Yeah. And look, I'll answer this with um, an example of that we're having right now. So I mentioned, I mean, we hired a team in the US. I, got, I hired a, a VP of R&D who has a similar background to me. I knew him from when we were in our PhDs. Uh, but he's done, you know, maybe 12 different commercialization programs in a very specialized type of optics. He's way better than me. I mean, I, not even, it's not even close. I should have worked for him a, a while ago. Um, but additionally, then we brought on someone that's in like a specialist in silicon photonics. That guy is like the best in the world. And we're probably going to hire one of the best laser designers that's in the U.S. Uh, and so you keep thinking, well, I keep bringing all these amazing talent Um isn't that great? My VP, what he said to me is, I've tried to hire these guys three times before, but the difference is that the vision and the the growth of the company wasn't compelling enough for those guys to leave their jobs. So that is what I offered. As a founder of Baraha, we have a mission that's so exciting 
and funding and growth and ESOP that's all together so exciting that the best people in the world want to come. And I think that is like, that's ultimately the best sale. Like, you know, these guys, they cannot do it themselves. They need us. They need that mission. Yeah. Okay. That was terrific. I think that's a great place to, to stop this formal part of the, uh, of the panel. Um, so the Emma, thank you for uh, facilitating and answering the questions. It's a, it's a tough gig to do both. And, uh, but I really appreciate that. Uh, Sibby and James, awesome. I look, congrats to all of you on the progress you've made. You know, I've been watching your journey closely for at least the two years or more than that now that we've known you. So, uh, it is pretty amazing. And yeah, we're delighted that you, you came along and joined us. Um, so look, I might kick the three of you off. Uh, I'm just going to go back and share my screen again, uh, and then just do a quick wrap. Uh, do hang around cause we do have some, uh, some, some networking to come. Um, the, let me just. Uh, do this. Yeah, so that was the first part, uh, which we're delighted about. Uh, I wanted to talk quickly about Canopy. So Canopy is the new membership tier. Uh, we talked about Summit. Summit is for companies that are worth $20 million or more, or you're definitely on that trajectory. Canopy is for earlier stage founders. So again, we, we don't have hard and fast lines in this, but are you worth five to 20 million? Uh, and that's in valuation, not revenue or anything else. So it's for earlier stage, seed stage founders, uh, you know, it's about peer to peer. The only people that understand the founder journey are other founders and the best people to help you on that journey are other founders. Uh, but most of us don't have time to go and build those relationships and get the trust and, and everything else that you need for that. So that is what we're trying to do. Uh, we've just hired uh, an awesome guy, uh, Gav, uh, out of uh, Brisbane, who's, who's helping roll this out. So Gav is going to be in one of the breakout rooms. So if you're interested in Canopy, go and find Gav. Uh, Gav's an ex, uh, an ex muso, so he's very energetic and uh, and he's awesome. So go and uh, go and chat to uh, Gav. A uh, couple of upcoming pitch events. Uh, Horizon is our angel uh, investor community. Uh, we're doing a couple of uh, events uh, in October. So we got one uh, in Melbourne, the fourteenth of October. Uh, again, we're just putting tags on these. The, the reality is we may not be able to meet up face to face based on what we're seeing with uh, this stupid little thing called COVID, uh, but we will do it virtually if if we need to. Uh, Melbourne, 14th of October and Frontier Tech. So I think, you know, deep tech, things that are having an impact. Uh, we're doing one in Sydney around impact. So if you are in a for good sector, I mean, you don't have, just because you're for good doesn't mean you're not for profit. So still investable company and uh, and, and a good business that can, can receive funding. Uh, and then Adelaide, uh, at the end of October, we're doing one on ag tech. So if you are in any of those or know anyone uh, that wants to talk to some of the best angel investors in the country, uh, do uh, check out and, uh, and, and let us know. Uh, we are hiring. Um, we have got this role open. So director of membership for Horizon. So this is our angel investor community. Uh, look, this is an awesome role. I mean, anyone who's interested in investment or, uh, you know, startups really, I mean, a bit uh, broader beyond that. So you, you get to hang out with, I guess, a couple of sides of the, the, the coin. So on one hand, you're going to see the best startups in the country uh, who want to come and apply and, and pitch to these people, uh, but also more exciting. Well, I don't know it's more exciting, but you, excitingly as well, you will get to hang out with some of the best angel investors who are out there and also, you know, encourage the next generation of angel investors who should be, um, you know, investing in that asset class because it's a super exciting place to be and, and really really good so please do check that out uh we yeah we want to get smart money into the ecosystem uh it's not a syndicate but it's a community so think about that and we'd love to hear from you if you're interested uh look thank you again uh to our national sponsors uh, macquarie bank kpmg high growth ventures aws and farmark ventures we love what they do and we really appreciate their their support uh, two other, um, if you enjoyed this, we've got two others coming up on the similar theme. So the next one is winning the war on talent, uh, building a culture and doing some inclusive hiring. Uh, tech startups facing lots of challenges, attracting the right people, keeping the good ones and building high performing teams. Uh, the next two are really going to be focused on that. So um, part two, salary and benchmarking, uh, that's on the 26th of August. Uh, coming up and part three is uh, how investors can support startup talent. So again, we've got a fantastic uh, panel for both of them. That's in the 2nd of September, uh, both of them at lunchtime. So uh, finally, we are going to jump over and do some uh, some networking. Um, 
yeah, so yeah, it's all on the screen there. So it should hopefully make sense. I'm going to stop sharing and get Claire to, to start um, guiding us into the, uh, the, uh, these places. So Claire, do I hand to you now? And uh, I think we, uh, Emma, Sibby, James can jump off the screen and go and indulge yourself in the networking. So over on the left-hand side of your screen, you can either join a session, which is the, the group, uh, or do the one-to-one -one networking. I'm going to go to the networking because uh, I know the, the, the people in the sessions room, but I think you guys might be going to the sessions room. So we'll see you all there. Thanks, guys.